learned also that we kind of invented the atomic bomb, and that's another. I'm sorry. Of shame. I'm, wait, you what? Well, that oh, but what? Einstein like set the scene. World War II is a topic that came up in my U.S. history class pretty much every other year. I mean, in America, it makes sense. Back-to-back -back World War champs. However, in Germany, they're taught about the war very differently, and I thought it'd be interesting if I had my German friend here on to chat about what exactly it's like growing up in Germany and learning about World War II, the Holocaust, and whatnot. So, hello, Anne. Where are you from? Hello, I'm from Berlin. So, would you say Berlin is like the most or least German of all the areas? <laughs> Yeah, uh, actually, it's the least German place. Yeah. It's like a little island within Germany. There's so but, many yeah. English-speaking people in Berlin, comparatively. Yeah, that's true. Interest so you grew up in Berlin, went to school in Berlin. Yeah, but I think my growing up was still very, like, German-speaking. Mm -hmm. I went to, and this is a disclaimer in general, <laughs> I went to a Christian private school in Berlin, mm -hmm. really well off, and I can just speak from my own experience in... Mm -hmm what I learned at that school. But yeah, it was a very German growing up, I'd say. So one of the things that we learn a lot about, uh, a big focus of World War II, at least from my experience growing up in the US, was a lot about Adolf. We learn a lot about Adolf Hitler, like a lot of the focus is on like, what, why did he do this? It, it was, obviously it's a lot about the Nazis, but a huge amount is understanding Adolf. And from my understanding, there isn't as much of a focus on Adolf. I feel like it's Germany. the opposite in a way, like you don't want to create a kind of personality cult around yeah, someone yeah, yeah. who's like, in fact, I would like to compare it almost to Voldemort in that it's like, <laughs> he who shall not be named. Really? You don't even like saying his name in a way. I wow. feel like there's so much shame connected mm. to the whole topic that the name, like if someone says it, you're a bit like, <gasps> oh, really? Yeah. But you still have to learn, uh, it's just not the focus in school, I suppose. The focus is more like Nazis and NS time in general, mm -hmm. but not not so much about him as a person. Obviously, that's part of the of the whole history. Mm -hmm. But there's, yeah, it, he's not the main focus, at least for what, what it was like for me. In terms of what I had to learn in school, I know in fifth grade, we learned about the Holocaust by reading a book called Number the Stars, which was about a Danish family that when Germany, Nazi Germany invaded Denmark, they tried to like find the Jewish people that were hiding and they tried to smuggle some Jews away. But it was our first like introduction to Nazi Germany and World War II. That was fifth grade, around age, age 11. 11. Yeah. What, what would you say is rough timeline for when you possibly learned about that type of stuff? I mean, it's hard to remember anything from like primary school anyway, mm. but I think we weren't confronted with the subject just yet. So probably, oh, interesting. It, we start uh, high school in, well, I started high school in year five and I think that's when it first came up. Mm -hmm as well. I think that's when we started having history class. And then, as you said, like, I think it kind of came up every year, every other year. Oh, really? Um, I felt like I was constantly learning about <laughs> how World bad. War II and how bad everything was. And yeah, the whole of history seemed to be about that. Is there a big shame element involved? Absolutely. I think that's an extremely omnipresent theme in German society is this kind of like shame and that's just instilled in all of us. Do you feel like World War II is something that most people would feel comfortable about talking as adults as well? Definitely. I, I mean, it's it's a big topic of conversation. We all feel this like need to, I mean, actually we have this like remembrance culture, Erinnerungskultur, that okay. we, it's important to keep talking about it as not to forget. And mm -hmm. I personally actually think that our generation is still quite connected in a way with the whole mm -hmm. thing, emotionally speaking, because our parents, if you imagine a whole class of students and all of our parents were basically not, uh, grandparents, sorry. <laughs> it's like, all I'm of, sorry? No, no, no. But our grandparents but yeah, might not, like, that's just a fact. Like, yeah. if you have a class of 30 people, maybe some of them weren't, but everyone has grandparents and great grandparents who first had experienced this. And mm -hmm. so we're quite connected to it. And I have the feeling that the generations now mm -hmm. coming up, they're going to start to be more and more disconnected. So I'm personally wondering how this whole like remembrance culture is going to affect go the younger on. generations. Yeah. Well, that's something that I think about in terms of the way that the UK and the way that America teaches usually World War history is we just really like going on about it, about like, oh, we won the war. It's mm -hmm. amazing. We won the war. But there's so much more to history now. We've had so many years in between then. Obviously, we should be learning about these things lest we repeat them. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if the generations after us and then after them will put as huge an emphasis on that. For us, it's much more of a emotional thing. Emotional. Because we're personally connected to it. We feel that we have some kind of personal responsibility not to repeat those mistakes, mm -hmm. uh, at least in my kind of bubble, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's also like 
right-wing extremism, populism on the rise in Germany, unfortunately. But um, yeah, that stands in opposition to this very present culture of remembering. Did you guys have to read Anne Frank's diary? I think that was on the curriculum for some mm -hmm. schools. I personally didn't, oh. which is a shame. I was named after Anne Frank, actually. Really? Yeah, my dad's name is Frank, and so my name's Anne. So when my mum would call us, she'd be like, Anne, Frank. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I find that very strange. It is really weird. And so you didn't have to read it though, but that's part of a popular curriculum. Yeah, we definitely. Because I think that's something where I feel like most US schools have Anne Frank's diary as a requisite you have it's like the easiest way of broaching the holocaust in eighth grade roughly is when mm -hmm. i did it in my school district uh in the news recently it's being pulled from a lot of school districts do you know the reason enlighten me because of uh it's pornography what well there are bits of it in which Anne specifically talks about like i didn't know that the like vagina had an outer and inner labia and okay. i've been and so because it's discussing a woman's body that's pornographic in the US in which everyone is, well, conservative parties are just super scared of anything possible. Okay. Well, you so. could just scratch that bit and leave in the historically relevant bits. No, that would be making too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would make way too much sense. Right. Well, I mean, I definitely remember that we talked about the fact that it exists and what it kind of contains and her story, mm -hmm. but we didn't read it as like firsthand. No. Did you read any specific books on the Holocaust that you had to like read through? Because those, I'm done. We read those two and that was pretty much it. I don't. Now that you say it, I don't actually remember reading any, like, books. I think we oh. just, like, had history books, you know, like, mm. that are made for students in a certain year. And they would tell you what happened, but no, like, actual sources. Maybe, like, pamphlets that, like, the Nazis would distribute? I don't know, that kind of stuff? Interesting. That is firsthand. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the shame slash guilt about World War II is taught to you? Or is it just kind of comes with the territory of having to learn about what happened so much? It's definitely taught, but not only in school. I feel like it's almost instilled in you by society in general. Like mm -hmm. you kind of come into class already feeling like that will be the angle. Yeah. Like that will be the angle because everywhere you go, like especially in Berlin, mm -hmm. it was really nice being able to also go to a lot of museums and historic sites like, you know, the Holocaust um, Memorial yeah. in Berlin and all those things. And so you grow up already with all of that like info kind of around you mm -hmm. and you go into history class already knowing that you, the main emotion is going to be shame. Yeah. <laughs> and that just kind of perpetuates itself throughout the years of learning about all the things that we did wrong. Yeah, because I've seen online that uh, it's quite a debate whether or not you get taught it too much. But then again, some people think it's just relentless in German school, supposedly, as you keep having to learn about this. And it's like to the point where you're just I get it. I'm upset. But at the end, when they become adults, a lot of Germans kind of feel like, well, I wouldn't have wanted less considering all the alt-right people that are currently growing. That's exactly how I feel. I, I actually remember a certain point in school where I was like, oh, we have it on the curriculum again this year. Yeah. You're nine, you're 10. You're, like, I get it. You know, when you're a teenager, you'll yeah. kind of feel like, okay, I, I got it. Yeah. But now that I'm an adult, I'm so glad also to have people around me, everyone understanding yeah. just the importance of it all. Isn't also Holocaust denial illegal in Germany? That's true. It's very interesting because uh, we have freedom of speech, obviously, guaranteed by the well, Constitution. Not too free. So we've got freedom of speech. Um, and But what does that mean then? <laughs> if you're not actually, like, uh, not to be the extra American angle, but it's like, we're free to say anything we want as long as it's not on this laundry list of things. No, no, okay, so the Constitution says that the freedom of speech can only be limited by general laws. And a general okay. law means that it cannot forbid a certain opinion okay and there is one single exception to this which, which is, is nazi opinions interesting. and this obviously went up all the way to the federal constitutional court who decided that it is built into our constitution and built into whatever this says against the wording of general law we will mm -hmm. just interpret it widely because the constitution was built as like a counter to make proposal, sure this doesn't happen again. A counter proposal to exactly the rule that we had before. We like made this constitution to make sure that exactly this would not happen again. And so this kind of stands completely on a different, it's a different thing. Direct opposition to the yeah. Nazi party. Fascinating. So you're kind of, th that is literally the only exception is like no Nazi only exception. So like a, a popular argument that's made in conservative circles in the UK and America is usually slippery slope argument. Do you feel like that yeah. argument can be made of what are Nazi opinions? Mm. or fascist is it just Nazism? I feel Nazism? like it would be hard to get there because in the end it's very clearly defined what Okay, it's clearly Nazi, defined. Mm -hmm. I mean that 
is relating to the Second World War and mm -hmm. the National Socialists. Like, there's no room for interpretation there, is there? No, no, you're right. Well, some people will try. And they usually will fail. Yeah, okay, that's true. <laughs> when I went to Berlin last time, I took a day trip to Dresden. And when I went to Dresden, I was surprised that I saw swastika type things like just written on and I went oh that's uh, wow I didn't think that would be a thing and then I found out Dresden is one of the most parts of Germany unfortunately actually it's mainly the former GDR states oh so like Sachsen Thuringen Brandenburg that have problems with interesting right-wing populism mm -hmm. clearly not to do with the education well actually there was a case of teachers who mm -hmm. taught anti-Nazi mm -hmm. to students, you know, like the, the, the normal thing that we discussed. Sure, sure, sure. And they were kind of bullied out of the school. Um, and so there, th that just happened a couple months ago in Germany. Wow. Um, because the, I don't know, the school said, or the, the, the parents of the kids were mm -hmm. offended by this, like, too left-wing approach to anti-Nazi education. Yeah. So, I don't think it could be too left-wing. It's a very binary system of, like, you're either pro or anti-Nazi. It's not like, oh, he he hates the Nazis too much. I don't think there's a too much, though, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the AfD, you know, the, mm -hmm. the new kind of right-wing populist party, yeah. party is on the rise in those lender in those countries. In Great. Country, unfortunately. So I find that from my uh, education, there's not really a big distinction between Germans in the war, as in it's like we're at war with Germany. Yes, Nazi Germany, but there's not as much a distinction between Germany and Nazis, Germans and Nazis. I'm assuming you guys are taught... Not just that it's Germans, as in all of you, but the specific Nazi party of the Germans. Right. Um, actually, I feel like this is a bit of a problem. I have a feeling that we were taught that there was this kind of big group of people, like mm -hmm. a very indistinct, like mass of people of Nazis. And then the war was over and there was the denazification and now nobody was Nazis anymore. And for me, that was the only thing that I didn't like about the about the education that I got, mm -hmm. really understanding that everyone was, almost everyone, except for those who were like in direct like opposition, which weren't many people, mm -hmm. that all of Germany was responsible for letting this happen. And that after the war, it wasn't just gone. Like it was like an intrinsic problem, like a societal structural problem that uh, to be honest, we still haven't really like removed from the core of the bones of the society. And so, to differentiate between Germans and Nazis, it, I mean, that's a it's a tricky question. How do you teach that to kids? But, yeah. Especially it's like, you was your grandpa. Yeah, and that's the thing. Oma, that is Oma. exactly the thing. Yeah. But uh, at least in my family, that was always like handled really openly to say like, yeah, you're not your granddad, but his brother was like, you know, he was in the Nazi party. And for reasons that maybe you can't blame him for in the end. Like he needed to survive, he needed mm -hmm. to feed his family. And we all like to say that, oh, back in the day, I wouldn't have joined the Nazi party. Yeah. But it's kind of like, if you really think about it, honestly, you can see now populism on the rise. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you talked a bit about denazification, which is something we don't really learn much about in, mm. for, at least from my experience, from my US world history course, we learned that we came in, we kicked them Nazis out, and then we just yeah, went, all right. You? Where'd you kick them out oh, to? We, 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 just, we fixed Where'd it. What do you mean? Yeah. We just, we won. <laughs> we then went, we'll just take a bit of Berlin. And then we f***ed off back to America to, you know, build microwaves and fridges. Beautiful. Well, I, that's the whole problem. So what is denazification, for the audience, what is denazification? I don't... I mean, in the end, what they're trying to do is, like, remove Nazis from positions of power. Oh, okay, okay. So, well, maybe it is true that the Nazi party wasn't officially in power anymore in the mm -hmm. parliament... I mean, if you look at the fact that all of the courts were filled with Nazi judges and where do you find the same number of non-Nazi yeah. judges to put into those offices? Where do you find in the administration and all the ministries? How do you denazify? Because everyone was wrapped thousands up Thousands of people. Mm. So it's, it's up for debate how successful that all was. It, I mean, how can you just say, oh, we've got a new constitution and now everyone will not be Nazis anymore? I mean, it's kind of worked in a way. I mean, definitely, there's not <laughs> Nazi rule in Germany anymore. Yeah, it's not to put it, yeah. One sentence at the end of the history book will be like, oh, and then, you know, the, what do you call them? 
So the Russians, the Americans. Oh, the Axis and the Allies. Yeah, exactly. Do you, do you learn about that type of stuff? We do. I mean, because it's interesting living in Berlin, you can like draw a nice little map and see, oh, this part was then ruled by the Americans. And, and then there's the French. The British yeah, and the yeah. French. And then, you know, we learn about that too. Okay. But almost in a way that's too fun. <laughs> Where it's like, look at this map. This was a French part. This was a British part. What, so did you have to learn a lot about the U.S.'s involvement, like in World War II? No. What? That's the whole thing we learned, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> we, you didn't learn about us? We... <laughs> Saving you from yourselves? I think, so the main part that I remember learning about was actually what happened in Germany kind of leading up to and during the war. So like mm -hmm. all the laws that were passed against Jewish people and the Holocaust. And Kristallnacht like, and stuff. Yeah, exactly mm. that. Like how it must have been between like 1933 and 1945, being in Berlin specifically, mm -hmm. like, yeah, with with all the laws making it impossible for uh, for Jewish people and other minorities to literally just survive in the city and yeah. do things. Uh, a huge aspect of World War II education for us is all the battles. We have to like mm -hmm. be like, this year, D-Day, we came on in, we fought the Nazis here and then here. And then the, did you have to learn about a lot of the battles and things? No, not at all. Maybe it's just, I think a lot of it uh, with the education depends on the teacher that you have. Sure. What their angle is, what their like interest is, I mm -hmm. guess, like what they put the focus on. And we didn't learn about the war at all. Like it all starts with the Blitzkrieg and Poland. I was about to say Blitzkrieg, it's got to yeah. be taught. So all right. that's, that's the first thing. And then obviously there were like some atom bombs and then there were <laughs> that's, battles. There were some atom bombs, boom, boom, we win. We win. <laughs> Oh, but, so did you learn about the Pacific Theater? Hmm? Sorry, that's what it's called. Did you? Uh, the Pacific Theater is the part of World War II that took place in the Pacific Ocean, like with Japan, after we killed the Nazis. Oh, you killed all the Nazis? After we finished the job, yeah. <laughs> you did the denazification. Uh, yeah, the U.S. just, yeah, we just did it. We, just, we didn't even kill Hitler. He did it himself. Oh, true. But yeah, so we're, we're taught most of the stuff about Europe. And then we have like one chapter where it's like, yeah, also we dropped a couple bombs on Japan. I think the focus in the German education is mm -hmm. not at all about the warfare okay. but more about kind of the ideology and the way that it That's actually smart. worked in germany like what mm -hmm. was it like living in a country that was at war mm -hmm. and what about all the discrimination and how did that start how we how can we prevent that from happening again it's more about the ideological side of things i think that makes way more sense because the way that uh we were taught specifically is so, such a huge focus on the warfare and like mm. here are the type of tanks and the airplanes and the superiority and the numbers and the battles and it gets really into the data but not actually talking about the the crux of it all Yeah, like what are you fighting for like yeah. why are they dropping those bombs we just got pearl harbored and then we went all right fine <laughs> do you learn about pearl harbor though it uh, rings a bell <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this makes sense. I'm, I'm just saying it's it's uh, so it's literally the U.S. was basically funding and trying to help out in World War II without being involved. And then when Japan bombed uh, Hawaii, mm -hmm. we were like, well, Japan signed a contract with Germany. So I guess it's Nazi kicking time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't, don't really learn about, learn about all, any of that. We have like the allies come in. And then why are they allies? Oh, because they've kind of fought together against Germany. For us, it was really focused on just like Nazi ideology in Germany and the warfare, not so interesting. Fascinating. Yeah. That's actually the most interesting thing I get out of this is the, the lack of details. I, I wish we had less of a focus on just dates and numbers and more about ideology. Like, what can we learn out of this mm. besides like, don't be a Nazi? <laughs> because of the way that World War II and the Holocaust, Nazism and such is taught differently in both countries, do you feel like the way that they teach patriotism and nationalism in Germany would be grossly different to how they teach it in the well, US. They just don't teach it at all. Well, it's not a thing. Well, <laughs> what like, do you mean teach? Well, uh, well sorry, it's called, uh, we, I feel like the US literally looked at Nazi Germany's book and went, that's good. Let's try and implement that level of propaganda. So we do things such as the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag every single morning in school, which is bizarre considering in Germany, there's a relationship where people are very proud to be German, but in a way that's not like, well, but not like that. You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe it's because I'm from Berlin where we don't really feel that German. I, I think generally around Germany, there's more a sense of local patriotismus, so like mm -hmm. local patriotism, okay. where you're like, oh, I would say I'm from Berlin and I'm pretty proud to be from Berlin because I like the place mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. where I feel at home and, you know, but I saying I'm German is almost like if someone asked me where I'm from, I'd always say I'm from Berlin and not I'm from Germany. And To you, it's similar to saying, I'm European. You're like, well, that's a yeah. big area. 
I, I think oh. it's more that people have shame connected to being German. Like, we don't really sing our anthem. We don't when really when like do you sing the anthem? Uh, football. That's it. Just for football. Well, maybe other sports too. I don't know. Well, England sings the national anthem at some sporting events. And then at the pub, if you're really drunk. No, I don't know. Does that happen? I... I've never heard the English national anthem. But yeah, we will sing the US national anthem any chance we can. It was implemented into all sports things to drum up patriotism and nationalism. Oh, we just don't have that. No. Having the German flag on something just feels wrong. I remember moving to England and seeing like the Union Jack, the mm -hmm. flag on like a carton of milk because it's like, this is from the UK. I'd be like, oh, you've got your flag on there. It's like there's flags around. People will have like, I don't know, just as decoration. Yeah. We don't yeah. do that. We well, don't. The Union Jack has, sorry, it's the the Union flag has way less negative connotations here because it's more of the unity of the four countries. Mm -hmm. But usually, stereotypically, if someone has like a uh, St. George's Cross, which is the English flag, that's usually the same vibe we're like, oh. I see. Sometimes. Yeah, because if yeah. someone in Germany has a German flag, like hanging from their balcony or mm -hmm. like in front of their house, you'll be like, not. Tourist. <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe the same thing, but it's in the U.S. I don't know if you've ever been to like the deep south, but you, I've mm -hmm. driven through like Mississippi and Alabama and it's like every single house has like a perfectly constructed flag waving, which is also lit at all hours of the night because legally it is written into flag code that if you do not pull the flag down at sundown, it needs to be properly lit so that it can be seen waving above your house. And isn't it also a crime to burn it? Yeah, well... No, this has now been, basically, there's a freedom of speech. So you have the right to protest and burn the flag, but it was also against the law to desecrate it. And I learned in Scouts that if any part of the flag ever touches the ground when you're pulling it down, it needs to be cremated, essentially, in an honorable way. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> God bless America. Sorry. Oh, say, can, can you, you see? See, so you know the American one? <laughs> I also know the German Oh, you know the German one? Yeah. I did a meetup when I used to do meetups way back in the day when I went to Berlin. And I thought it was really interesting how just talking about certain things about World War II, people's eyes just, they get yeah, really like, oh. Yeah, they take it extremely seriously. It was almost as if they had done it themselves, these yes. like 17-year-old uh, fans. The and they were like, that's the sense of shame that I mean. Is tut and slide? Is yeah. That? Yeah, very yeah. interesting. Whereas I feel like just from my upbringing in the US, it's such a pride of things that we didn't necessarily do or our dad's dads might have been involved in it but is it really a sense of pride to it's fake part pride. of a yes. world war i mean sure you won but like it, it's just an all-over loss for everyone isn't it we're not really taught about it like that we're taught about it as in that's it's a how, huge yeah. win for america for us it was just everyone's a loser maybe that's why like maybe it's because you lost you're like we didn't lose everyone lost <laughs> Whereas we're like, we won, <laughs> suck it. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> I think it's a, just a very pacifist way of being taught. Like the war was just terrible for everyone. We just focus on like, yeah, all the lives lost. American pride is so strong, but it's also weak. It's like strong facing, very superficial level because we're very proud because everything that we've been taught about it, but we haven't been taught everything. <laughs> So it's this weird mm -hmm. sense of false pride. And you should be so proud of your country that you will allow people to burn the flag because it's their right, as opposed to being upset because someone kneels for the national anthem. So it's like a very shallow pride. You don't have any pride, pride necessarily. I think we just really see our place in the world. Mm -hmm. Also, we see that other people look at us as the ones who started both world wars. And yeah. sure, like we might be a bit proud of having great cars and whatever else might come from Germany. I don't know like some nice inventions that we've had, but in like a more cultural way, the yeah. way that we feel within like the world is very apologetic. Interesting. I also find that Germans are always the number one people I see whenever I travel anywhere else and they're always speaking German, but then no one that's German that recognizes German ever, oh. they pretend they don't know each other. Yeah, like we were just on the tube and oh, we yeah. saw a German girl and I'm just like, okay, no, I mean. I was, was eavesdropping. She was talking about speaking German or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She was German on the train in England, speaking, speaking about speaking German. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, I do have that feeling that when you're abroad and you see other Germans, you don't necessarily want to be, like, connecting with them. 
you th- it's, there's not a sense of pride or cohesion within like fascinating oh the germans amazing see that's i am because i'm like oh i can speak that language ish let me give it a shot if i heard americans when i'm when i'm traveling I, I don't know i feel like there's more we can connect with in america i'm like oh we have the same upbringing of like tv shows and things that culturally we were taught and I feel like there's more of a culture. America has a stronger uh, binding culture, I guess you could say. Yeah. Also, like, there's just within Germany, as I said, like, there's just this, like, local patriotism. Oh, that's that it, yeah. For me, as, like, a Berliner, I don't necessarily feel like I have so much in common with Bavarians. Like, yeah. I mean, we're still both German. Like, it's all good. Like, it's all friendly. But I wouldn't... Yeah. But they speak Irish, so you're like, I don't really care. I consider myself a Londoner very strongly, but... I've oh, I've lived in London. I've and London's so different than the rest of the UK that the relationship between my experience in London versus someone's experience in like North Shropshire probably very different. So like I don't know probably. how much we can relate besides the fact that we both like Greg's. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Everyone does. We learned also that we kind of invented the atomic bomb and that's another I'm piece sorry? of shame. I'm sorry. Wait, you what? Well that oh, but what? Einstein like set the scene. Have you seen Oppenheimer, though? I did. I think it's just part of, like, us wanting to take all the blame. In that oh, okay. Case. You know, it's like, oh, well, we made it possible. We're so sorry. Like. So you literally are taught you made the atom bomb? Kind of, yeah. Well, <sighs> not made the atom bomb, but that Einstein, who was he even? Yeah, he was. He was German, German but because it, he was also he, Jewish. Yeah, so he had to immigrate to Switzerland, right? And then the U.S. But uh, wow. yeah, uh, we learned that, like, we were just basically the cause of all evil in the world. Fascinating. I was going to talk about interesting warfare bits, but I, that's things you weren't have been taught, like the Can hidden cities that we made. Oh. As in, like, at one point, uh, England made, like, a fake city, like, with uh, where they had lights turning on every night, even though there was no one living there, to, to oh. trick the bombers into thinking that was a town. We learned a lot about what it was like living in Berlin during the war and all the, like, underground shelters that people would have to go to. And then, you know, what what it must have been like being in those shelters, having, like... The, the sounds that mm-hmm. told you that you had to go like underground and you know people kind of just sitting there all night and having to bond and tell stories and yeah. did you have to learn about carrots being really good for your eyesight yeah we did that's a big thing in germany carrots eat, eat your carrots but you know why that's taught because it's not true Oh my god, do you not know the answer to this because um, that's really funny i listened to a podcast about this <laughs> it's about world war 2 and is the English had invented radar, and we didn't want oh, the Nazis yeah. to know, so we spread propaganda that the British are just eating tons of carrots, and it made their eyes better so we could see all the planes. And so we were hoping the Nazis would be like, oh, we must eat more carotten. I did, didn't tell you that we literally learned 50% of our 10th grade year just talking about World War II, just talking about battles. Like, oh, just talking God. about the build-up, the war, the D-Day. It's literally 90 days of our school year in 10th grade. It's interesting because I looked at the curriculum Mm -hmm. and basically it doesn't say in a lot of detail the topics that should be covered. Mm -hmm. I mean, it says like Nazi (laughs) history. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's just about Just the vibes. No, but it's more like what should the method be? What should the kids learn? Like what kind of ideas should be instilled in them rather than teach them about this warfare tactic and that atomic bomb? How did I not bring up? Did you have to visit a Holocaust like in concentration camp? We didn't. I Wow! I thought that was going to yeah. be a thing. I Definitely it is a thing. Mm. And classes go on like school trips. I don't know why we didn't. Because we visited the Holocaust Museum uh, in New York and in Philadelphia, I think, during two different years. We went to the museum. There's like a, oh, yeah. there's a really good museum in Berlin that's also like really, really terrifying. And I remember it having a big impact on me. Mm-hmm. Like I remember one thing that there was like, a kid's suitcase and that was all they had and like i don't know it just really got to me and that so that had a similar effect maybe but people say like going to the actual concentration concentration camps camps is different yeah i've never done it but i know that there's so many in germany that are left up to not forget so that's like school trip yeah Uh, my teacher just loved taking us to the school trip uh to the cinema the cinema we went to the cinema every time we would just get the projector taken out (laughs) You got to go to a cinema? To the IMAX. Yeah. (laughs) To watch Oppenheimer and be like, we made this bomb. (laughs) Yeah. And we're sorry. Yeah. No, I just, I I was just thinking about when I went to New Zealand to do Mm -hmm. an exchange, I saw that really other countries treated, treat this topic in a very different way. Yes. People just make jokes and like, hit Hitler at me. 
And really? Like, really, just, they had no sensitivity to the topic, and they just thought it was funny. And I, like, as, like, a 14-year-old already, I was, like, completely unacceptable. Like, for us, that's, like, a no-go. It's criminal. It's terrible. As in, like, New Zealanders, Kiwis, would just... Yeah. Because they're like, oh, we had a German exchange student before, and we know something about Germany. Do you still have Hitler? Like, what about him? Oh my God. And then they would like draw swastikas and stuff. And for me, like I remember, I was that's at rough. The, when, I was, when I was a kid, I was at the playground, and I saw like in one of the uh, playground like bits, like mm-hmm. the slide or something, there was a little swastika drawn that, drawn there. And I went to my mom. I was like, oh, "Look what that is! We have to like call the authorities." Like that's how we feel. There it's would so scandalous. There were loads of swastikas. Like it's always playground equipment because kids are like, "This is a bad symbol." I'm going to draw it on a slide. Yeah, that maybe was, it was a kid. Yeah, I think that's a thing in the U.S. as well. But definitely not in Germany, I suppose. No. Wow. I mean, surely there are kids who love to do that just because they want to be defiant. But sure. it just, it's like Voldemort. It's like the signs, the words, the topic is like broached in a very responsible manner. I make Germany puns in this video that I had to cut because they were offensive. I'm so sorry. Some of my jokes work, some don't Deutsch land. Does your brain operate just in puns? When your German father dies mm. and he wants to be cremated, do you do it in Bavaria because you have to buy urn? <laughs> How many of these do you have? I just came over that. Really? That's not bad. I, I mean, was just like... cycling through different words that I could split syllables on. Mm-hmm. Buy urn. Buy urn. Perfect. Lovely. Yes. Can you, can you list all the 16 lender? No. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know too many. It's like if you try to name all 50 states. I could. No, you couldn't. I tried it once and I could. I got 51. Aren't there 52? That's how I know you can't, because there's 50. <laughs> <laughs> 52 states. Puerto Rico is a really? not a, not I a state. Really? I thought there were 52. There's 50. Have you lost some in the in recent No, we years? only gained them. <laughs> Lord. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, Anne, for coming on, having this little conversation. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. If you're from Germany and you had a different experience, tell us about uh, what your education was like, if it was a little bit different than Anne's or a little bit similar. And also, if you're an American or UK person, if the things that I talked about definitely rang true in terms of like a lot of war tactics, less ideology. It might be different in England, as I didn't go to school here, but just thought it'd be interesting to hear from your thoughts. I'll be uh, hearting my favorites in the comments. Anyway, thank you guys very much for watching and hopefully I'll see you on my channel next Sunday. Auf Wiedersehen. Ciao. <laughs> ciao, ciao. A choose. Juicy. Just juicy is gross. That's more gross juicy than Gumo. Juicy is amazing. Oh. <laughs> Are we already filming? Yeah. Were you filming this whole thing? Mm-hmm. Even the rimming? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't film that rimming. <laughs> Oh, oh God, I'm also a bit worried that you might want this video to be funny, but I have no sense of humor when it comes to Nazis. <laughs> That's actually part of the video. <laughs> Germans do not have a sense of humor in general, but especially about the Nazis. I'm not gonna say you're wrong. They don't even look for the jokes. They do not see them coming. Nazi. Oh. Not see them coming. Okay.